Welcome, and thank you for staying by. At this time, all participants are listening on mode until the question and answer session of today's conference. At that time, you may press star 1 on your phone to ask a question. Like to inform all parties, today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Again, today's conference will begin shortly. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this media telecon. I am Karen Fox with NASA's Office of Communications, and we're here today to talk about the upcoming launch of two payloads, NOAA's JPSS-2, that's short for the Joint Polar Satellite System, and NASA's LOFTED, that's short for Low Earth Orbit Flight Test of an Inflatable Decelerator. The payload will launch on board a ULA Atlas V, and it's scheduled for 1.25 a.m. Pacific time on Thursday, November 11th from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. Uh, our launch coverage is going to start an hour before that at 12.45 a.m. Pacific or 3.45 a.m. Eastern. We also have a tower rollback show starting at 11 p.m. Eastern tomorrow night on Wednesday, November 10th. You can watch both shows on nasa.gov slash live. We have several speakers here with us today. We have Satya Kaluri, who is the program scientist for the NOAA JPSS program. We have Ken Jux, program scientist for the Limb Sensor Ozone Mapping and Profiler Suite on the JPSS satellite from NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. We have Jordan Gerth, meteorologist and satellite scientist at NOAA's National Weather Service. We have Heather Kilcoyne, ground project manager for NOAA JPSS, and we have Joe Del Corso, Lofted Project Manager at NASA's Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. We are going to have some opening remarks from our speakers, and then we will move to answering questions from the media on the phone as well as from social media. If you're on the phone lines, uh, please hit star 1 to get into the queue to ask a question, and for social media, you may ask your questions using the hashtag JPSS2 and the hashtag lost it. With that, we will get started. Off to you, Satya. Thank you, Karen. Good afternoon, folks. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about the GPSS mission and why it is important for our nation and also for the entire world. GPSS stands for the Joint Polar Satellite System. It is a polar orbiting satellite, meaning it goes around the Earth from pole to pole 14 times a day collecting measurements over every location of the Earth twice a day, once at 1.30 in the afternoon and again at 1.30 at night. We are the leader in an international partnership. That's what the joint partnership is about with other agencies 
to provide these global measurements for the good of mankind. This is the third in the series of the satellite. The first one was launched in 2011. It's called the Suomi NPP. It finished 10 years in service. Uh, the operational satellite, which is the second one that was launched in 2017, is the lower 20, and JPSS-2 will be launched, uh, and when it is uh, successfully reached in orbit, it becomes the operational satellite and the third in the series. It's cloudy here and rainy and cold in California. It's sunny over the East Coast. I can see fires over Africa and South America and a hurricane nickel forming in the Atlantic. And I can also see hail from fires and pollution over Asia, all from the JPS satellites. There are several sensors that the satellite uh, has on board that make measurements of the Earth in the visible region of the spectrum, like the true color imagery that we can see with our naked eyes, like photographs, as well as other parts of the radiation, such as infrared and microwave regions of the spectrum, which we really cannot see with our naked eyes, but can only see with uh, sensors on JPLs. These observations provide measurements of various Parameters or variables of the atmosphere, such as temperature, humidity, the dry or weather processes. It's a um, very unique sensor because of the wide uh, variety of observations that the satellite covers over oceans, land, and the atmosphere, like the ozone hole or Antarctica, the three dimensionality of the hurricanes, like what we are seeing now of uh, Hurricane Nicole, wildfires, air pollution, ocean color from night and also lights from light. With that, I would uh, like to uh, give the mic to my colleague here. Great. Thank you. This is Karen Fox. I want to give one quick correction. Uh, with that early morning launch, I gave the, the wrong date. It is 1.25 a.m. Pacific time on Thursday, November 10th. I fast forwarded to November 11th, but it's Thursday, November 10th. And with that, we will move on to our second speaker, who is Ken Jock. Uh, thank you, Karen. So many of these observations actually started in the research realm long before the SUMI NPP and the JPSS series started. So NASA launched three satellites that are actually still flying today. Uh, there was a Terra satellite in 1999, the Aqua satellite in 2002, and the Aura satellite in 2004. Those made a broad... Uh, stretch of observations that try to understand the Earth system amongst all of its aspects. And one of the power of uh, these, these various data sets is their length. So as I mentioned, these have been up for over 20 years now on average. And one of the nice things about the SUMI NPP and now the GPSS series is that it will continue many of those key on observations. In particular, we noticed that we knew a number of the uh, sensors on, particularly the Aqua satellite, were critical for um, operational weather forecasting. So NASA and NOAA teamed up together to uh, work out which sensors were really needed to uh, assist uh, operational uh, weather forecasting and other key observations going forward. And that was... Uh, how we started the SUMI MPP project, and it um, was launched in 2011. So because of these long uh, data sets that we can now get from combining these various data sets together, the data are much more powerful than they would be if they stood apart. With gaps in data records, it becomes very hard to piece things together. So um, because we now have a regular cadence for overlapping these observations, uh, we'll be able to uh, continue these observations for a long period of time, and the data become more and more powerful for really understanding how the Earth system changes over the decades of time period. Um, actually, NOAA and NASA have a history of collaborating in particular on ozone observations since long before even a Terra satellite. We've uh, had both launched uh, observations for ozone from satellites for a long time before that, and we've been doing ground-based observations and, and airborne observations related to um, uh, ozone in particular over a long period of time. So 
this is just kind of an example of about how our two agencies work together and will continue to work together going down the road. So with that, I'll pass it on to Jordan. Next up, Jordan Gerth. Thank you so much. I'm Jordan Gerth, the National Weather Service meteorologist and satellite scientist charged with overseeing the weather observations that are available to over 120 of our field offices nationwide. The National Weather Service has a mission of saving lives and protecting property. JPSS supports our ability to meet that mission. I'm excited to join you today as we prepare for the, this momentous launch that is the culmination of the collective effort of NOAA, NASA, and our industry partners. As you've heard, 11 years ago, the U.S. launched the predecessor mission to the Joint Polar Satellite System, the SUMI National Polar Orbiting Partnership, which provided transformative Earth observations. The upcoming launch of the JPSS-2 satellite represents an essential step in preserving the continuity of low Earth orbit observations. And what's particularly key about JPSS is that it is an operational mission. Let me explain how the JPSS-1 satellite, now NOAA-20, SUMI NPP, and soon JPSS-2 aid our meteorologists in meeting the National Weather Service mission for all Americans. First, JPSS data is a major input into U.S. and international global numerical weather prediction modeling systems. The observations are, are global. The predictions are local. With JPSS, the quality of local three to seven day weather forecasts is outstanding. Second, particularly for Alaskans, JPSS provides regular coverage over the poles to detect fires, monitor flood extent, and track Arctic weather phenomena. And for all Americans, JPSS provides more than twice daily observations over the Atlantic and Pacific oceans that helps meteorologists monitor weather systems where we do not have the benefit of weather balloons and only limited buoys compared to the dense weather station network over land. The National Weather Service was able to predict the landfall of Hurricane Ian on the Florida coast in part due to observations that we collected with NOAA 20 and SUMI NPP. Today, uh, we are currently monitoring Tropical Storm Nicole, and I was informed by our meteorologists that they are using data from this mission in assessing the intensity of that storm which is currently forecast to uh, intensify into a hurricane. Let me explain a little bit about the data that we're using from NOAA 20 and SUMI NPP in monitoring tropical systems. The infrared window imagery from the visible infrared imaging radiometer suite or VIRS instrument provides imagery at a spatial resolution of 375 meters or approximately a quarter mile and enables the detection of thunderstorm features such as overshooting tops. Overshooting tops are indicative of storm severity. The VIRS instrument also has a nighttime visible scene capability that can reveal mesospheric gravity waves emanating from the center of tropical systems. The low light capability is only possible with GPSS. Uh, this band will also help us monitor the recovery in Florida as nighttime lights are correlated with economic productivity. So we can see the lights as they come back on in Florida as they recover from Hurricane Ian. Finally, the Advanced Technology Microwave Sounder, or ATMS, can show the structure, the eyewall of storms beneath the cloud canopy. Our meteorologists at the Hurricane Center use ATMS to uh, correlate that storm structure to intensity. I'd also like to mention that you may have heard about GOES previously. We had a launch of GOES earlier this year on March 1st. Uh, JPSS and GOES are complementary observations. Uh, the difference I like to say is that we get a nice view of the uh, contiguous U.S. in this hemisphere with GOES, and we get more detailed information but less frequently with JPSS. So both of those satellites are a huge asset to our forecast capability. I'd like to thank uh, you for joining us to talk uh, and for me to talk about the benefits of JPSS to the National Weather Service. As soon as these remarks have concluded, I look forward to your questions. Go JPSS too. Fantastic, thank you, Jordan. Uh, next up, we have Heather Kilcoyne. 
Thanks, Karen. The JPSS ground system includes everything necessary to get the data from the satellite in space into the weather forecast. The system receives data from the satellites with antennas at the ground station, delivers the data using networks that transport the data across the globe, and processes the processes the data using software and hardware that transforms the raw satellite data into the data products that we use in the weather forecast and climate models. The two JPSS primary ground stations are located near the North Pole at Svalbard, Norway, and near the South Pole at McMurdo Station in Antarctica. Our backup stations are in Fairbanks, Alaska in the north and Troll, Antarctica in the south. Each of the primary ground stations sees every one of the 14 passes per day for each polar orbiting satellite. The backup stations only see about 9 to 11 passes per day as they are further from the poles than the primary stations. Together, the ground stations gather about 400 gigabytes of data per day, which is equal to about 200,000 digital photos or streaming 80 movies per day. The data is then processed in the ground system to over 7,000 gigabytes of data products per day. The system is a multi-mission ground system and also takes data from, our, from the ground stations from our partner missions with the DOD, the Department of Defense, Japan, and Europe. The data is then processed at their home agencies and shared for input into all the global weather models. These missions are timed to provide multiple observations over one location per day at different times so that we can observe how weather patterns and other temperature changes during the day, which are critical input for weather and climate models. The JPSS data processing system successfully migrated to a cloud-based architecture in early 2021, which is paving the way for an integrated enterprise NESDIS data processing system for all NOAA satellite missions in the cloud over the next several years. The migration to cloud allows the data processing to use technological advances in processing hardware much sooner than the traditional hardware technical refresh schedule, allowing the government to focus more on software and product innovation that can benefit the end users and reduce data latency and improve data products. Thanks, Karen. Thank you so much. We have one more speaker. A reminder that if you're on the line as media, you can press star 1 to get in the queue to ask questions, which we will answer after Joe Del Corso speaks about Lofted. Thank you, Karen. As Karen mentioned, I'm Joe Del Corso, uh, the Lofted Project Manager from NASA Langley Research Center. Um, Lofted is the low Earth orbit flight test of an inflatable decelerator. Uh, which is essentially just an orbital entry demonstration of the hypersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator or HIAD technology. The HIAD technology is a deployable aeroshell that is stowed for launch and cruise and then is deployed in orbit prior to atmospheric entry in order to decelerate payloads at destinations with an atmosphere. The HIAD technology, once demonstrated, will be used by NASA for heavy down mass mission missions such as putting humans on Mars, as well as for commercial applications, such as ULA's Smart Reuse Program to recover the new Vulcan engines. The Lofted RV is going to be flown as a secondary payload on an Atlas V launch vehicle. After delivering JPSS-2 to Earth orbit, the Centaur second stage will deorbit the Lofted vehicle, turn the Lofted vehicle on, and then Lofted will then inflate the air shell and be released by the Centaur. Lofted will enter the Earth's atmosphere at 8 kilometers per second, or about Mach 29, 29 times the speed of sound, at which point Lofted will begin communicating with an Iridium satellite to send status updates to NASA ground systems. During entry, Lofted will also be taking a number of measurements across a suite of instruments, uh, including temperatures across the aeroshell, pressures and heat flux on the nose cap, as well as 360-degree video from six video cameras and IR data from 12 infrared cameras. We'll also be able to get an aerial mapping of temperature from the fiber optic strain sensor, or FOSS, which will be on the nose of the, of the vehicle. This demonstration is a culmination of 19 years of development work, ground development work, and will test the HIAD technology at a scale and at entry conditions that are relevant to Earth and Mars mission and fusion opportunities. It's important to note that Lofted is a public-private partnership, and we want to recognize and, and say thank you to ULA, but this public-private partnership is between NASA and the United Launch Alliance and has infusion capability that will support ULA's smart reuse program after this successful flight demonstration. Karen, thank you for having me.
Great. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. Uh, we will be taking both media questions and social media questions. We will start with a social media question. So turning over to you, Allison Tankersley. Our first question from social media is, beyond meteorologists, do you have any sense of other groups who would be using the data coming from these satellites and what for? I'll be happy to take that question. Uh, this is Satya Kalori from GPSS. Um, while the uh, satellite is designed for weather prediction, that is not the only reason for the satellite that is being launched. The satellite takes um, images of the Earth, like I said, twice a day. And with these images, we can look at um, drought conditions, which are very important for forecasting uh, food productivity. Uh, we have global users who use the uh, data sets from a satellite. We create a product called the Vegetation Index or the Vegetation Health. This is one of the primary products that the Department of Agriculture uses to measure uh, how global crop production is going on, identify hot spots for drought, uh, so that we have a good assessment of, of food production around the world. Um, in addition to meteorology and, like I said, uh, food production, we also make measurements of the ocean color. It is very important to look at ocean color for at least two reasons, one of them being uh, monitoring the ecosystem of the ocean for bioproductivity um, because the fish feed on phytoplankton for growth and productivity. The second one is when there are harmful algal blooms, which devastate fisheries as well as uh, coastal habitats, we can detect them and track them using ocean color. Uh, in addition to this, we can also measure air quality, for example, smoke and smog, um, emissions from fires that are very important for issuing air quality alerts. We can also look at uh, polar ice caps and how they are changing over time, how the polar ice is moving. We can look at uh, the ozone hole. Um, these are all the non meteorological applications. The data band that the George Gerard mentioned, mentioned uh, a few minutes back is a very unique capability. We can, in fact, look at uh, illegal fishing uh, at night based on the lights that they carry. And we can track uh, fishing around the world because of that. And the satellite is so sensitive, we can look at uh, oil flares from oil fields and determine how much methane, for example, that they are emitting. Um, so here are some of the uh, non-meteorological applications. Uh, if you'd like to uh, know more about any of these applications, uh, please put in the chat, and I'll be happy to discuss more. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Satya, for that answer. Uh, we will go to the next social media question. The next question from Matt on Twitter asks, will the lofted aeroshell reentry be visible at all from the West Coast? I wish it was because I am on the West Coast, but unfortunately, no. Um, the, the aeroshell is actually going to be re-entering about 300 mile, nautical miles off the coast of Hawaii. Even then, you wouldn't be able to see it. Um, but we do have an aircraft that will be flying around. The SciFly uh, group will be out there looking up, and we're hoping at some point in the near future to be able to release some of that video. Thank you so much. A reminder, if you do have a question on the line, feel free to press star one to get in the queue, but in the meantime, we will go on to our next social media question, please. Sean asks, can you explain more about NOAA's role 
post-launch for the JPSS-2 satellite. So NOAA's role post-launch, it's a NOAA mission. So the, um, everything for NOAA really gets started post-launch. NASA gets all the glory for the launches and the rockets and building the flight aspect. Um, but after that, um, it's, it's NOAA's mission for what, everything that Sasha just talked about uh, and weather input to the weather models, the climate models, working with all the partners and using the non-meteorological aspects. But um, it is, it's, it's NOAA mission, so everything, and we'll be following along with it for years to come. Heather, can I add a few more things to what you just uh, described? Um, after launch, it is, as Heather said, a NOAA mission, meaning we operate and fly the satellite on a day-to-day -day basis. The ground system that Heather described with a global presence of antennas receives the data. Uh, the ground system also creates a variety of products that I talked about, whether it is products to measure the or products to measure hurricane intensity, or uh, the algorithms that detect fires and emissions or air quality. They're all generated routinely and operationally by NOAA. We distribute the data, we archive the data for free to anybody who has to have access to the data. We also uh, do science with the data, meaning we create climate data records to analyze how the Earth is changing over time. Um, so these are all NOAA unique functions. Right, and our satellites are operated um, by the NOAA operators out of the NOAA Satellite Operations Facility in Suitland, Maryland. So they just become part of our constellation of the, all the NOAA satellites that are followed through and, and operated by NOAA. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to have time for just two more questions, uh, both from social media. Uh, so handing it back to you, Allison, for the next one. This is a lofted question, and it is, what is the benefit of testing lofted on its own without a payload? And then kind of a follow-up of why is it important to then land heavier payloads on places like Mars? Oh, great questions. All right, so <clears throat> first off, um, we would have loved to have actually uh, brought a payload back. Uh, unfortunately, we are a ride share uh, on whatever launch is available and has the upmass capability, so we had to be a little bit more stringent objectives for this particular mission. Um, so, so what we focused on specifically was demonstrating that we can enter uh, front orbit and survive and take measurements. Um, first, and then the next step will be um, recovering uh, larger assets such as the um, the uh, twenty thousand pound Vulcan engines. So, so that that answers the first question. The second question is, what is the benefit of heavier payloads? So, right now, uh, we're currently limited in what we can put onto the Martian surface. If you go with a standard rigid air shell, you can only land about one one and a half metric tons. To give you kind of an analogy, it's one that I've used previously. That's about the equivalent of a very well instrumented golf cart. Um, by using the highest technology, that 18 to 20 meter scale, which is what we're, we're aiming for, uh, we should be able to put 20 to 40 metric tons to the surface of Mars. On top of that, the way that high decelerates, it, it decelerates very high in the atmosphere, which gives us an advantage. Uh, to smaller aeroshell or the more rigid technology, which dives really deep into the atmosphere before it can slow down. By decelerating high in the atmosphere, we're able to uh, pick and choose where we want to land. What that does is it opens up um, a much larger area of the Martian, of the Mars surface. Currently, using classic technology, we can only land on about 50% of the Martian surface, what we call the Martian lowlands. Um, by accelerating high in the atmosphere, we can put 20 metric tons to about 85% of the total surface, including the southern highlands. If there's any other questions, we'd be happy to take them. Thank you. 
Thank you, Joe. Uh, it looks like we have one more social media question today. Yes, they're asking, uh, can you go into a little bit more detail about the GOES and JPSS series? How do they compare and contrast? Sure. Thanks for that question. Uh, Jordan Gerth here with the National Weather Service. So the GOES satellite stands for Geostationary Operational Environmental Satellite. Those satellites orbit as the Earth rotates. So essentially, it's always looking in the same location. That has a major benefit for monitoring weather systems because our frame of reference, if you will, is not moving. We're always looking at the same spot of the Earth. So as storms, as the clouds change subtly, we can use GOES to monitor that. The difference is in the orbit. The GOES satellite is about 22,300 miles off the surface of the Earth, compared to only about 500 miles for JPSS. Because JPSS is a lot closer to the Earth's surface, we can get different types of observations. So instead of just seeing in the clouds, which I probably shouldn't say just because it's very beneficial information, we can actually see some of the other features in the atmosphere. For example, uh, if we want to determine the temperature structure of the atmosphere or the amount of water vapor, we can use instruments on the GPSS series to help us with that. And as I mentioned, GPSS also provides us information about the detail underneath the cloud canopy that can easily translate into uh, information about storm intensity and aid in the prediction. As such, you mentioned, the GPSS series orbits pole to pole approximately every 100 minutes. The Earth rotates underneath it. So it's really two uh, unique sets of observations. Both of them are operational. Both of them support our forecast capability. And uh, we're very happy to uh, be able to see this JPSS-2 launch because of its global collection of observations. And at, at the end of the day, in order to have good weather, local weather predictions, we need to have all those global observations uh, to inform our meteorologists. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody uh, who spoke today, and thank you to everybody who joined us. We are going to wrap up as those are the end of our questions for today. A reminder that launch will be at 1.25 a.m. Pacific time on Thursday, November 10th. And you can watch launch coverage starting an hour before that at nasa.gov slash live. Go JPSS too and go Lofted. Thanks so much. That concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may disconnect at this time.